Hello, history fans. Welcome to our module three Gilded Age lecture, mini lecture. <laughs> um, so today we're going to be talking about the Gilded Age. The period that we're talking about is roughly-ish 1870s, 1880s, maybe even into the 1890s decades. Uh, some the good part about this class is that it pretty well goes by decade pretty quickly, pretty easily. <laughs> so 1870s, 1880s. Uh, the Gilded Age, that phrase was uh, coined by our good friend Mark Twain. He came up in our last lecture module. Uh, when something is gilded, what does that mean? Have we heard that phrase before? If something is gilded, it, it looks like gold. It looks really expensive and nice, <laughs> but it's just covered with a thin layer of gold. It's not actually solid gold. And so Mark Twain, because he's sarcastic, uh, called this era the Gilded Age because on the surface, everything looks really good. There are a lot of progresses being made in society and in the economy, especially. Uh, but underneath, there are a lot of problems. Things aren't living up to expectations in the Gilded Age. It looks really nice on the surface, but once you start digging down deep, there are a lot of problems. The number one problem during the Gilded Age has to do with wealth inequality. That's what we're going to be talking about. All of the problems that we're going to be talking about today root from that one problem, wealth inequality. So here's an important statistic for us to remember going forward. In the Gilded Age, 90% of the wealth was held by the wealthiest 1% of Americans. The wealthiest 1% of Americans own 90% of the wealth. That's pretty rough. So a very small percentage had a whole lot <laughs> and everybody else had not much. Wealth inequality uh, caused a lot of problems in the Gilded Age. So today, this module, module number three, is all about problems, all sorts of problems. Problems everywhere, problems here, problems there, problems in the economy, problems in the city, problems in the farm going to be a depressing lecture, probably. <laughs> so we said that wealth inequality is the number one root cause of a lot of other issues. How does that wealth inequality happen? How is it that the 1% get so much money? And what do people think about that? Uh, is it good or bad? There, There's really two ways of, of viewing those one percenters, the uber extra, super wealthy, they're either called captains of industry or sometimes robber barons. So a captain of industry. This would be somebody who has uh, built a factory, started a factory, is employing a whole lot of people, is creating a product that is sold to the masses and helps them in some way. Uh, he's, he's pushing his industry forward. He's pushing the economy forward. He's employing a lot of people. He's giving to philanthropy and charity and using his wealth well, a captain of industry. That's a pretty positive uh, portrayal. On the other hand, robber baron, that sounds less positive. Uh, a, robber, a robber baron, a robber baron. Baron is somebody who, like, a, it's a title, somebody who's wealthy and influential and powerful, but a robber. He's a robber. He's gotten all of that wealth and power and influence on the backs of other people pointing out that the factory owners, the factory managers, aren't the ones doing the actual work, that they are benefiting off of the extremely hard labor of a whole lot of workers who are very, very poor. There are two, uh, well, there are several ways. We're just gonna talk about two examples of ways that those one percenters, the uber extra super wealthy, got all of that wealth and gained all of that wealth. Uh, trust and vertical integration, two pretty popular business practices in the Gilded Age. A trust is when many companies were assigned to a single board of trustees. This was used extensively by John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil. So we might have heard his name, John D. Rockefeller, a, a New York man, Standard Oil. I always think about this as like an umbrella. <laughs> it's an umbrella feder confederation. Uh, Standard Oil is an umbrella organization for a lot of different companies. So it's the oil company, the oil industry. When we think of the oil industry in 21st century Oklahoma, we think of gas for cars. Well, this is before cars, so that's 
of it exists, but it's a pretty small business. Also, pretty popular business was kerosene for for lamps, you know, gas lamps before electricity becomes very popular and widespread. That's how people had light. So gas, uh, kerosene lamps. Also, this is the age where a lot of factories are popping up. So lubricants for all of those gears, that was really big money. All of those are, are oil and petroleum products and items, but they're, they're very different and they're made differently and they're used differently and they're marketed differently. So they should logically be separate companies, but they're not. Rockefeller puts them all together in this kind of umbrella organization, Standard Oil, that allows him to cross-train employees to cut down on the number of middle managers. He's able to uh, use and reuse machinery and machinery parts and factories. Uh, he's able to apportion resources more logically and effectively. So everything is streamlined. Everything is well organized. A well oiled machine is, can I make that pun? Is that too obvious? Is that on the nose? Uh, <laughs> so everything's streamlined, everything's efficient. That means that Rockefeller and Standard Oil can keep their costs low, which means their profits will be high. They make a lot of money. Another example of a business practice that was used pretty extensively in the Gilded Age is vertical integration. This is when one business interest or one person can control many companies in the same industry. So a good example of this is Andrew Carnegie of U.S. Steel. We had a reading from him. He should sound familiar. Andrew Carnegie uh, owned the entire steel industry from beginning to end. <laughs> uh, he owned the the mines where the ore, iron ore was dug out of the ground. He owns the smelters where it's processed into steel, this new fancy technology steel. He owns the manufacturers where they make the steel into stuff. He owns the railway companies where they transport it from point A to point B. So from the time that it's in the ground to the time it's on a store shelf to be bought, he owns all of it. He owns all of that piece. It's a monopoly on the steel industry. He owns the whole thing. He controls it. So that means there's no competition. He doesn't have to keep prices down. He can charge whatever he wants. Again, it's very efficient. His processes are streamlined. The machinery can be used in a lot of different places or, or reused for different processes. New middle managers, workers are cross-trained and able to do a lot of job. So costs are low and predictable, which means that profits will be high. Another example for the ag kids in the room of vertical integration was Gustavus Swift of Swift and Company. Uh, I like talking about him because he's America's first agribusiness. He's America's first agribusiness. After the Civil War, Chicago became the meat center of America and Gustavus Swift was really interested in the pork industry. Most of the pork that was consumed in America went through Chicago and Gustavus Swift of Swift and Company owned all of it. <laughs> he owns the farms where the corn is grown to feed the baby piglets. He owns the ranches where the baby piglets are born. He owns the, the feedlots and the stockyards and the butchering houses and the meat packing plants in Chicago where it's where the meat is butchered and processed. He owns these fancy newfangled refrigerated railway cars that get the meat from Chicago to the Eastern Seaboard where it can be sold and eaten. So from the time that baby, baby piglet is born to the time it ends up in a New York City restaurant, he owns it. He owns all of it. Almost an entire monopoly on the pork industry in America, Gustavus Swift. His profits are very high, as you might imagine. So again, because of there's these two ways of thinking about these guys uh, in these one percenters, people like Rockefeller or Carnegie or Swift or, or JP Morgan or any, any of the others we might mention. Uh, there's different ways of thinking about them, right? They're either captains of industry or robber barons. Sometimes there's the idea that these 
gentlemen are helping. They're pushing society forward. They are fostering inventions. On the other hand, there is an acknowledgement <laughs> that they're getting all of that wealth on the backs of other people. Robert Bears. So because of that, they're they the one percenters, the super extra uber wealthy, they find themselves in a strange situation where they have to justify keeping all of their wealth. Uh, this is something that has never really happened before in American history. Uh, wealthy and poor people had existed forever. Uh, that's that's not to say that classes haven't existed, but the, this is really the first time where the distinction between the classes is so vast. And so these wealthy men, wealthy families, find themselves in a position of having to justify keeping all of that wealth. And that's where your readings for this week will pick up. We had uh, William Graham Sumner and Andrew Carnegie kind of debating <laughs> about what wealthy people should do with their money, if anything. Uh, they're debating the problem of wealth inequality, or or even if it's a problem at all. So moving forward, wealthy people organize, and it seems to do a pretty good job for them. <laughs> so labor also organizes. Now, small sidebar, when we say labor here in this lecture and the next, uh, we are talking about the working class, the, the poor people, the use and me's of the world, <laughs> in contrast to big business like the Rockefellers and Carnegie's. So labor, workers, they also organize. This is an era, the Gilded Age is a period when a lot of workers join labor unions or trade unions and they organize because they think that this is their, their only hope for being able to achieve workplace reforms of a variety of ways, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, again, this is not to say that labor unions or trade unions hadn't existed yet. They've existed for centuries by this point, but this is the first time in American history where they get very, very popular. Uh, this is a period where we see workers are more likely than not to join a labor union. Labor unions are pretty effective and and uh, trying to achieve and agitate for some workplace reforms. Our example of a labor union that we're gonna talk about is the American Federation of Labor, the AFL. This was created in 1880s by Samuel Gompers in Columbus, Ohio. Samuel Gompers started work from a very young age. He started work as a, at 14 as a cigar roller in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and he was a member of the Knights of Labor, and the Knights of Labor was another organization that was a little bit more radical and a little bit more, uh, had too many voices. And so he it, he sees the problems in his labor union, and it, is, it inspires him to establish this other labor union, the AFL. The AFL, like I said, I think still around today, they have a three-prong program. If it's not one of these things, they don't care about it. They want higher wagers shorter hours, better working conditions. One, two, three, bam, bam, bam. Higher wages, shorter hours, better working conditions. This might not seem all that radical or all that revolutionary to you <laughs> uh, because we have these things now. But this, and this period in the 1880s, uh, it's very, very common for workers to be working six days a week, 12 or 14 hour days, in, in a factory floor, in a factory setting. So it's incredibly long hours. They want shorter hours. Uh, it's very common for wages to be at a pittance. There is no such thing as minimum wage yet. Uh, that doesn't exist until the 1930s. So in an absence of a minimum wage, the, the factory owners can just sort of charge whatever they want. Uh, it's very common for people to be working for a nickel a day. And if you don't want to do it, fine, don't. Because some schmuck just got off the boat and will gladly work for a nickel a day. Uh, better working conditions. That's kind of the broadest one, but also maybe the most important. There's no OSHA yet. <laughs> There's no OSHA. So in a factory setting, it's 
if you're working 12, 14 hour days, it's very common for people to not be allowed lunch breaks, not be allowed bathroom breaks or smoke breaks or anything like that. People are, get tired. In an effort to keep workers working, factory owners would often lock the doors, <laughs> which keeps workers on the floor. Uh, but it also means that when the building catches fire, the workers can't escape and they burn to death in fires across the country. There's no uh, fire escapes. There's no, you know, maybe you've seen them, but like now it's mandated that doors have to open out so that if there's a fire, what happens? Everybody rushes to the door. And if the door opens in, there's like people like swooshed up against the door and they can't get out. They can't pull the door in. They have to push it out. So now even if like you can't physically get to the door, just the press of people is going to push you on that little push bar. <laughs> <laughs> to get out of the building so that people can escape the fire. Uh, so so proper doors, doors not being locked, uh, people being allowed breaks, people uh, being concerned about things like workplace safety or workman's comp or, or pensions or retirement. So if you get hurt and you can't work, your family has some sort of recourse. Uh, any of those things would be things that would fall under better working conditions. Very broad, but very important and very necessary. So even though that these are the three goals of the AFL, their number one goal is shorter hours. They really want an eight hour workday. So over here on the right side of the slide, we see one of their advertisements for the eight hour workday. They have eight hours for work, eight hours for rest. That's the dream. <laughs> and eight hours for what we will. This is how workers want to split up their day. Uh, but let's pay attention to that last column, the eight hours for what we will. What's going on in that column, in that picture? What is it that they want out of that supposedly extra eight hours? What are they doing? We see a guy in a rowboat on a pond, in a park, in a city park perhaps. They want to get outside. They want to exercise. They want fresh air. Uh, he's with his wife. Oh, how nice. They want time to spend with their wives, to spend with their children. They want to be better husbands and better fathers. He's reading the newspaper. Workers want time to be civically engaged. They want time to be good citizens so that they can be more intelligent voters, more active voters. They want time to continue their education so that they can maybe get a better job. So eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, and eight hours for what we will. But it's not that the AFL is advocating the eight hour workday so that they can just lay around and do whatever for that quote unquote extra eight hours. That last eight hour section of their day has very real important goals. They want to be better husbands, better fathers. They want to be better educated. They want to be more civically engaged. They want to be healthy. And they're arguing that all of those things will help them be better workers the next day. If if you had a nice relaxing time with your, with your family, you're going to be happy, which makes you a better worker. If you're better educated, you're going to be a better worker. If you're well rested and healthy and stronger physically and morally, you're going to be a better worker. So all of those things that they want with that supposedly extra eight hours, they argue will make them better workers. Now it's important to remember in the back of our heads that the AFL, not successful in the Guild of Age. <laughs> they, they exist, they're, they're agitating for all of these reforms like higher wages and shorter hours and better safer conditions. Uh, but none of those things come to fruition in the Gilded Age, it takes a while. It takes a while. Gilded Age is all about problems. Problems aren't solved yet. That's in the next module. <laughs> so let's talk about some more problems. Uh, problems of face facing the city. In cities across the urban eastern seaboard, um, all of these cities are becoming increasingly packed. So places like New York City especially uh, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and Baltimore and uh, even Chicago, all of these cities are becoming more and more populated, more and more packed. People are moving from the country to the city for jobs. Every year there are 
thousands of immigrants coming into the city, mostly in this period from uh, southeastern Europe, but other places. Um, and the question really immediately becomes, what are we going to do with all these people? <laughs> Where are all these people going to go? Uh, housing becomes the number one immediate problem facing cities. Too many people, not enough space. So at first, Andrew Carnegie, who we mentioned before, established U.S. Steel. Steel, a new invention, allowed the building of skyscrapers for the first time. It seems like an incredibly modern solution for a modern problem. The, the steel skyscrapers, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> it only creates more problems. Uh, uh, prior to this period, wooden buildings, you can get kind of five stories is kind of the max. So they had figured out, you know, engineers of the day had figured out how to get fresh water up five stories. But now skyscrapers, the sky is the limit. You can pack a whole lot of people into a very small geographic footprint, way more than five stories, but the problem becomes how are we going to get water up there? They don't know. <laughs> it takes them a while to figure out how to pump fresh water up to the top floors of the cities, of the, of the skyscrapers. So the housing shortage uh, creates tenement housing. These skyscrapers, new idea of using steel beams to build much, much higher. Uh, one of the common types of tenements, these are like apartment buildings, we might think of them as apartments today, was a dumbbell tenement, call that because of the shape, as you can see here on the slide. Um, take a look at this floor plan. This is like a cross section, like one floor of the dumbbell tenement. How many apartments are in this, are in each floor? There's four. There's one in each corner, right? There's one here, one top, one top right, one bottom right, top left, bottom right. What kind of rooms are in each apartment? There's a bedroom, a living room, and a parlor. What's a parlor? Uh, it's kind of like a fancy living room, a formal dining room sometimes. So what's not there? Well, they're missing a kitchen. Don't have that. So most, what most people would do, they'd have like a little hot plate situation set up in the corner of their living room <laughs> and, and they would, you know, cook food on that. Uh, but they don't have a lot of storage space. They don't have a lot of cooking space, which means that they're not able to have good, nutritious, healthful food. Uh, if you don't have nutritious, healthful food, it's very likely that you're going to be sick, physically weakened because you're malnourished. What other sorts of rooms do they not have? A bathroom. <laughs> the bathroom is shared. It's out here in the hall. That's what this is. So on the bottom, there's the stairs and then the top. That's the bathroom, the shared bathroom. So people who have lived in the dorms, what's the problem with a shared bathroom? Maybe your floor mates are not up to your personal standard of cleanliness. If everybody is sharing a single bathroom, it makes it much more likely for disease to spread. If one person gets sick, chances are everybody's going to get sick. These people are already primed to get sick because they're not eating healthful diets. They don't have access to nutritious food or, or cooking for themselves. Um, so the sanitation becomes, and you know, and even if nobody on your floor is, is sick at the moment by some minor miracle. Uh, they don't have fresh water in that bathroom. <laughs> so the sanitation problem quickly becomes an issue in the tenements. And it's not the only one. This is an image, a photograph, of Mulberry Street on Five Points in New York City. Has anybody seen the Gangs of New York? That's this. That's what this is. I would recommend that. It's Kind of a long movie but it's a really good movie the plot of course by you know everything that's happening in the front of the film is made up but everything that's happening in the background is very historically accurate it's super cool anyway i digress <laughs> five points is an area in new york city called that because it's where five streets converge and they meet uh this particular image is showing mulberry street one of the five streets mulberry street was 
kind of notorious for <laughs> being terrible. Uh, as you can see, there's high buildings. Everybody's cram packed in here. It's very, very crowded, which means disease spreads pretty rapidly. Uh, there are a lot of fleas and bugs that spread illness. We're living in the COVID days. We know that respiratory illnesses spread very, very easily and quickly when people are jam-packed in here like sardines, like we see. Uh, we also, I hope you noticed that this is an era before the car. New York City is still running on horsepower. You see the horse and wagons, which means that there are horse feces and horse flies <laughs> uh, in this area, not very sanitary. So there's just a whole lot of potential for spread of disease and spread of illness. Moral of the story there. Overcrowdedness also leads to a lot of crime. Uh, in Five Points era, area especially, there was a lot of petty theft, a lot of theft, a lot of pickpocketing. When people are, you know, crowded into a, a, a crowded room or a crowded street, everybody's kind of jostling each other. It's, it's hard to keep a hold of your stuff. It's hard to know if somebody just bumped into you by accident or if they're stealing your wallet. These, a lot of these people are poor immigrants, which means that they are very desperate. Uh, ab absolute desperation that is affecting a lot of these people leads them to a life of crime. If you have to decide over whether to let your kids starve or go steal some apples, you're going to go steal some apples. <laughs> so a lot of the crime, a lot of the theft, especially in pickpocketing, uh, it comes from a place of desperation where these people have been working their 14 hour days for a pittance, they still can't afford their rent or their groceries. And so they steal to make ends meet. When people steal, what happens? They get charged, they go to jail and their family is left without a male breadwinner. Not helpful either. So lots of problems. Into this problematic situation, step the political machines. Also in Gangs of New York film. <laughs> the political machines. Uh, political machines were organizations, underground organizations. I don't know if I can say if they're underground. They're kind of an open secret. Everybody knows about it. <laughs> but nobody wants to admit to it. Uh, the political machines are organizations that have a single goal. To obtain and keep power. To get a personal payoff. Which they call the graft. Full name. Uh, so let's take each of those two steps in order to obtain and keep power. How do they do that? Through what they call the ethnic connection. Basically, political machine machines try to help new immigrants. So remember I said that in this period, during the Gilded Age, there's thousands upon thousands of immigrants coming from mostly southeastern Europe, places like Poland or, or Italy, maybe. Uh, and they're very poor, they're unskilled, they're looking for a job, they've come to America because it's, you know, the plate land of opportunity, not the American dream. Uh, but put yourself in their shoes for a second. Like, let's say that you're a Polish guy and, and you've spent all of your money trying to get to America and you finally did it and you see the Statue of Liberty and you made it and you get off the boat and here's your wife and kids trailed out on the dock behind you and then it suddenly hits you, oh my God, I'm in America, what do I do? <laughs> Where do I go? I don't know anybody, you don't speak the language. And then suddenly somebody walks up to you and they speak Polish. And they're like, oh, hi, saw you just got off the boat. Welcome to America. Do you need help finding an apartment? Do you need help finding a job? Do you need help getting your kids enrolled in school? By the way, I'm from Tammany Hall. The local political machine, whatever it is, Tammany Hall is the most famous one out of New York City, but there's one in every city. Uh, the local machine, political machine sends people to the block level. You know, every block has their Tammany Hall representative and they try to help immigrants in whatever ways they need. They help immigrants get a job. They help immigrants uh, uh, pay for funeral expenses. They help immigrants learn English. They help them pass the citizenship test and they get their register to vote. And then they help them who to vote <laughs> uh, in return for all of that hell, 
the Tammany Hall representatives expect immigrants to vote for their guy for political office. They're buying votes. So when Tammany Hall like finally goes defunct, uh, one of the high ranking officials named George Washington Plunkett, if we care, he, what a cool name, Plunkett. <laughs> uh, he wrote this like tell-all book about Tammany Hall and how it worked. And these are so, a couple of quotes from that book. He says, it's philanthropy, but it's politics too. The poor are the most grateful people in the world and they have more friends than the rich. What does that mean? What do you get out of that quote? It's philanthropy, but it's politics too. They're they're helping immigrants. They're they're giving them a basket of food at Christmas. They're helping them get a job, uh, whatever. But it's politics. They expect a vote. It's a quid pro quo relationship. The poor are the most grateful people in the world. What is that? Uh, if if you give a struggling family a basket of food at Christmas, that is going to make their year. That's made their whole life so much better they are so grateful for a basket of food <laughs> they'll be your best friend forever for a turkey like the poor are very easily bought the poor are very easily manipulated and they have more friends with the rich remember like that that previous slide that previous picture all of these people living in these tenement houses crammed in there like sardines even if by some miracle you yourself personally haven't ever benefited from Tammany Hall directly, like they've never helped you. You know someone that they have helped. You saw how amazed those kids were when a guy dressed as Santa came and brought them a turkey. You, know? <laughs> you saw how big a difference it made in your best friend's life when he got help finding a job. They have more friends than the rich. The poor are very connected. And so even if Tammany Hall doesn't, you know, Tammany Hall representatives don't have to help everybody. They just have to help enough people that people think well of them and will vote for them. <laughs> so they're buying votes. So that's how they obtain and keep power. In order to get a personal payoff, the graft, what's that about? They get a personal payoff, that graft, by taking advantage of opportunities. So the example that George Washington Plunkett uses in his book is that, let's say, hypothetically, a guy gets elected to the city council, and he, in the course of his duties, finds out that the city is going to have to build a bridge in this particular area in five years. So he goes down to that area and buys up all that land. And it's bottom land, and, you know, there's nothing there. It's an abandoned warehouse or whatever, and so it's cheap. But then in five years... The city needs to build a bridge and suddenly that land is really valuable and so he can sell it to the city for a hefty profit. He didn't steal. <laughs> he didn't embezzle any money. He's not a criminal. He didn't do anything illegal. He just took advantage of opportunities. He says the politician who steals is worse than a thief. He's a fool. He's a fool. Ouch. With all the grand opportunities around for the man with a political Oh, there's no excuse for stealing a sin. You don't have to steal. You don't have to do anything illegal. Just keep your eyes and ears open for opportunities. So what do we think about political machines, good or bad? Thumbs up, thumbs down. If we're thinking about our course theme of liberty, what do you think? Do they help liberty? Do they expand liberty? Or do they contract liberty? A little bit of both, right? <laughs> yes, they help liberty. They're helping people. The immigrants who are living in these cities and these tenements are beyond desperate. Uh, they are incredibly poor. They are starving. They are stealing. Uh, they have problems that need solutions, and nobody else is helping them. So in that sense, political machines do a lot of good, but they're doing it to buy votes. They are manipulating democracy. Inherently corrupt. Like they're not even trying to hide <laughs> that that's why, why they're doing it. Uh, and the things they do once in office are not illegal, but they're probably unethical. So eh, pros and cons. Political machines 
solve some problems, but only create other problems. So we talked about problems in housing in the cities. Let's talk about problems with democracy. <laughs> Let's talk about problems with the farm. Uh, farmers, Americans in rural areas are also facing a lot of issues. So over here on the left side of the slide, there's the problems and then the, the people, the organizations they blame for the problems are on the right. <laughs> First issue is uh, there is a decline in agricultural prices. During the Gilded Age, the number the first the top three uh, cash crops were corn, cotton, and wheat. Corn, cotton, and wheat, and for all three of those, prices are so low that it costs more to produce than you will get by selling it at market. So, like by the time you have all of your expenses, you you buy the bulk seed and you pay your workers and you spray and whatever, whatever you could sell it for that corn, cotton, or wheat is not going to bring enough to cover your expenses. Ag prices are incredibly low. Secondly, during the Gilded Age, America was experiencing a period of deflation and farmers are generally debtors, so that's a problem. Now, small sidebar. <laughs> when I call farmers debtors, I'm not trying to say anything like bad about the character of farmers. All I'm trying to get across is that it just so happens that the things that farmers need to conduct their business are high ticket items. And therefore, it seems like farmers are always paying off a loan for something. Uh, so so think about, you know, like a, 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 a thresher or or a combine or a tractor or a hay trailer or a cattle trailer or a flatbed trailer like those those are all high ticket items uh the bulk seed the land itself <laughs> those things cost a lot of money those are high ticket items and so it seems like farmers are having to always buy something pay off a loan to the bank to buy something that they need to conduct their business and then you know once they have the tractor it's going to break down and those repairs are pretty costly too so farmers are always paying off a debt for something. In a period of deflation, it's difficult to pay debts. So now oversimplified economics 101, here we go. Are you ready for this? Let's say that our class is the population of America, right? We've got 30 people in this class or so. Let's say that that's the population of America. Let's further say that there are three greenback dollar bills in circulation. If there are three green back dollar bills among 30 people, it's unlikely that I have one. <laughs> the odds are against me. That's deflation. There's not a lot of money in circulation. Farmers want inflation because during a period of inflation, it's easier to pay off your debts, which sounds backwards. It's easier to pay off your debts if there's a lot of money in circulation. Your money, uh, your money goes further. Maybe that's the way to phrase it. Your money goes further during a period of inflation. So it's easier to pay back debts. American farmers during the Gilded Age spend a lot of time trying to figure out ways to create inflation instead of deflation, which we'll talk about more in the next module. Over here on the right side of the slide, these are the culprits. These are the organizations that maybe don't cause these problems, but make these problems more difficult than they have to be. The first one is banks. Banks don't understand agricultural cycles. Even today, when you take out a, bank, a loan from a bank, the bank wants you to pay off that loan in monthly increments. It's very difficult to get it set up any other way. Sometimes you can, but it's hard. <laughs> Generally speaking, you gotta pay off a loan in monthly increments. That's difficult for farmers to do because that's not how their income works. Farmers get paid once or twice a year, right? You, you sell off your calf crop in spring and in fall, or or you have your corn crop in the late summer. Uh, you get paid once or twice a year. So it would be better for farmers, it would be easier to pay back their loans if they could have just one annual payment instead of all these little piddly monthly payments. Banks don't understand that. Banks don't like that. And so they don't do that. Elevator companies. <laughs> this also goes for like uh, butcher houses for ranching communities. 
they tend to be acting in collusion with their railroads. Think about even today, if you go driving around southern Kansas, it's it's very flat. And so it's always really easy to see where the towns are way before you get there because you can always see this little elevator, grain, grain elevator, way off in the distance. And you know that that's where the town is. <laughs> Each town has one grain elevator and one railroad goes through it. So every farmer in that whole community has to use that company. There's no competition. That company can charge whatever they want. There's nothing driving prices down. Farmers want competition. They want somebody to drive prices down. So all sorts of problems, problems abound. <laughs> We've talked about problems in the city and on the farm. We've talked about far problems facing democracy and people on the ground with our political machines. We've talked about the two different ideas of how to approach or how to think about the wealthy. Uh, the wealth gap means a lot of problems for everybody living in this period. Problems everywhere, all the time. Drama. So with that cheerful note, <laughs> uh, I hope that you have enjoyed this lecture and got a lot out of this lecture and we will continue talking about some solutions next time, which is much more cheerful. Have a good day, guys.